So welcome uh, everyone, thank you for joining us. Episode number 72. And uh, topic, of, topic of discussion this evening is, is presentation skills and, and public speaking and confidence associated with, with improving and, and being good at these things. Um, as podiatrists, we, we sometimes get asked to speak at conferences. We often speak in a multidisciplinary team and, and to smaller groups giving sort of case handovers. We may be speaking more informally to a group of uh, runners, non-professionals, or in the modern era, we may even be giving web-based uh, speeches or, or set webinars. Um, so we, we can't really get away from it. And whether you do a lot of it, whether you do none of it, whether you consider yourself good at it or not good at it, I think... I think I'm, uh, we all share the opinion that everyone can be better at it. So we are delighted that Kate Atkin has joined us. Uh, thanks for joining us, Kate. Um, by way of brief introduction, uh, and I, I'm, I'm aware this just scratches the surface, fellow of the Professional Speaking Association, Masters in Applied Positive Psychology, undergoing a PhD in imposter syndrome. My favourite one, the world debating, or was a world debating champion, I think thoughts and, and prayers to your husband on that one. And um, the author of several books, uh, one of which I'm an owner of, which is this one here, uh, Craig might be able to link to it, The Presentation Workout, which is pretty much going to be the framework for probably most of what we discussed today. So Kate, thank you so much for giving up some of your time to, to join us. You are most welcome. Thanks for inviting me on. So we have approaching 30 people online from the look of my screen here so as always guys if you're watching and you've got any questions for kate or, or anything comes up as we as we're going along ping them in the comments i'll keep glancing down in this direction rather rudely just to see what's coming in and if there's anything of relevance or if we get to it in time we'll we'll, we'll pitch it to kate for you but we're going to really kind of talk about initially about the, the three stages of giving a talk um or I've, I've artificially delineated them into the preparation of the talk the delivery of the talk and then some considerations for once the talk has has concluded. Um, so preparation can mean so many different things. Uh, Kate, could you kick us off by sort of talking us through a bit about what what how the importance of preparation for giving any kind of, of talk, um, and how that preparation may may differ depending on the talk we're giving, and, and just what what good preparation looks like. Okay, well, I, thank you. I think that for some people, preparation tends to be, let me prepare my PowerPoint slides. And I would say that is not really what I think of as preparation for a talk. There may be the use of PowerPoint to back up what you're saying, but in any preparation, whether it is 30 seconds just before you step onto the ability of, of preparing or commenting in a meeting, um, going online into a, into a Zoom as we're doing right now, sometimes it's just literally 30 seconds. That's all you've got to prepare is just to breathe, compose yourself and think of, right, what message do I want to get across? And if that's all the time you've got, then that's all the preparation you can do. But if you've got a lot more time, then you can do a lot more thinking about what message do I want to get across? Who do I want to get it across to? What are their issues and concerns? And also what process am I going to be using to get my message across? So it can be using this sort of technology that we're doing here and now. And obviously around the world, more people are using the online technology right now because we're not standing up in front of large audiences. Um, but it can also be thinking about, yes, some slides, but I, I like images on slides rather than necessarily lots of words on slides. But also thinking about the type of work that you do, you could also be bringing in literally some specific examples, whether they're of the orth orthotics. Um, I did watch your brief your TED talk, not all of it, but I did watch that piece in and just have a quick look at the orthoses you were you were discussing. <laughs> Um, and so it could be that you want to, in your preparation, think about how am I getting my message across? Is there something that I can take with me that's going to be a visual uh, example for people to look at and hand round and touch and feel? So that's that's all meshed into, in my mind, Perfect. the so preparation. There's also in the preparation about yourself. So thinking about how you're going to prepare yourself mentally as well as preparing the talk. So there's a little bit of that thinking about why me? Why am I giving this talk? What value can I add to it? 
and focusing on the positives of that rather than going into a meltdown um, as you talked to me earlier before we started the recording about the imposter phenomenon and you mentioned that in the introduction and, and as you're introducing me I'm hearing all of these things they're all true but I could go into a little meltdown of oh my goodness you know I'm, I can't do all of that and, and then you shrink into yourself and that's actually not very helpful when you want to get a clear message across so I'll hand it back to you, Ian, for any other further questions on preparation that might have sprung into your mind. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So it's pretty clear that you need you need to decide before you've even you know while you, before you've even started preparing the talk, you need to decide what what the message is going to be. So you always need to start at the end and work your way backwards. How much does the audience factor into that? Yeah, I think knowing your message really helps because then you can be clear in your presentation. You know, why am I giving this talk? What purpose am I, am I doing it for? What do I want to leave the audience with? And then think about why the audience coming? Why are they listening? What issues are they coming with? And even if you don't know, you can make some guesses. So a variety of audiences that I've delivered to and over time you get to get a general feel of these are the common threads that crop up in talks or conversations that I have with people whether it's formal or informal and if you don't know your audience well then you're talking much more generally so I think it might be harder for you to hone in on the preparations I think really for me if, it, if you're not clear on the audience my suggestion would be depending upon where you are is to get the questions from your audience as you or before you start the talk so whether you can gather some in online as I know you've you've done some some thinking and some gathering of some questions now or if you're face to face arrive early have a conversation with a few people find out what they want to get what what's their key issues and so i've done that a number of times and found one or two people have said little nuggets that you can then reflect back in your talk that really shows you're capturing the audience's issues and concerns brilliant and the size of the audience is that something you'd like to know beforehand going in will that change your preparation in any way I, it changes my mental preparation for sure, and I'm sure it would change everybody's. If you've if, you, if you've got an audience of of two or three, in, for some people that is actually harder than a sea of faces of five hundred to a thousand. Um, but for some people, it can be the complete opposite. So it it will vary from an individual. It also will vary on how much you need to project yourself. So here in this type of conversation, I don't need to use the same volume as I would if I was standing in front of an audience, even with a lapel mic on, and it's a large auditorium. But if you're in a room with um, acoustics that aren't particularly great but you've got 30 people then you do need to project yourself more so size of audience i think more about the mental preparation is the, is the thing that it will change the most rather than actually the presentation itself perfect so on this theme let's assume we'll set up a an artificial setup where we've been invited to speak somewhere we've gathered information about the audience so we know their size and their demographic we know what message we really want them to leave with uh, so we're, we're several weeks out from this talk and we sit down and we open our laptop and we open up microsoft powerpoint other presentation media are, are available of course where do you where do you start um are you straight to you know straight to digital i know some people still write things down on paper first do a bit of a mind map go, they go analog before they go digital do you how much planning do you do or do you just just get straight into PowerPoint and start designing and, and talk to us a bit about PowerPoint design um, sort of do's and don'ts or faux pas. Yeah, I, I love the fact that the first thing you said was it's several weeks before the talk because I'm wondering <laughs> who starts several weeks before the talk? Ian, 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 Ian does. Many, that's me, that's me. If it's a few days before the talk, it's good. No, oh in God. some seriousness, I think I think it, that that's lovely because it will vary from individual to individual, and some people it'll be the night before, and oh my goodness, I haven't got the slides done at all. Um, so for me, 
I, it's interesting in this, I do often start now with a bit of PowerPoint, but I think that's partly experience of having given so many talks on similar topics. Now, if it's a brand new topic, some of the things that I will do are different. So if it's a brand new topic, there's obviously there's reading background, there's research, there's, there's notes to make. So I often do the old fashioned, uh, and I've got, got it here in front of me, you know, the, the pen and the paper that really do make a difference to jot a few things down at that particular point in time. Um, I also like mind maps which give me the structure of my talk but what I tend to do is I will often start putting a whole load of things on slides and then working the slides down so you might put your thoughts onto a slide but then I'll actually pair the slides out so I'll take I'll take a lot more thoughts off the slide and then I'll often look for an image to illustrate that thought rather than show any words at all so sometimes my, my slides don't have words on them. Sometimes I use words supported by an image and sometimes obviously there, there are images in, involved. Um, with use of images, be careful that you are not contravening any royalties. Uh, so I use now my own images that I've taken. It's great having the phones that have the cameras on them and just snap images wherever you can and have those to use for yourself. That personalizes a, a talk. I think in, in a good effect. And from a slides preparation point of view, the key thing I would say is less is more. So fewer slides in number, but if you've got a number of key points that you want to make, perhaps that will increase the number of slides you've got, but you only have one key point per slide. So sometimes that less is more actually means less on each slide, but more slides. One of the other things, if you're presenting to a large auditorium that I find really helpful from a, a PowerPoint uh, background, as you say, Keynote and other, other um, versions are available, I use a black background or at least a dark background, I would highly recommend, mm. with light or white writing on it. So when you're presenting that in, a, in um, a large auditorium, you can't see where the edge of the screen is mm -hmm. from the slide projector. So it's quite a nice visual impact that it has on people looking at the slides. Plus it stops any glare if you're in a small room. It doesn't matter so much if you're in a large room, but in a small room, it stops the glare from the whiteness of the background actually straining people's eyes too much. Actually, that, that's interesting, Kate, because quite a few years ago, I mean, quite a few years ago, when people were trying to get fancier and fancier with PowerPoint, I deliberately went to a white background to keep it simple. <laughs> so almost all of my lectures are on a white background because I just reacted negatively to the overkill that was yeah. happening at that time. And I, I think, you know, that overkill that did go on, you know, I'm talking 10 years ago, you know, um, but I must, I must reconsider that now <laughs> yes well well the, i think the default with powerpoint is a white background so i would just suggest it's changed yeah. to the other way around because that makes it easier from a visual perspective yeah. plus when you mentioned about the overkill that people went on craig you're you're right that everybody used fancy animations and things mm. whizzing in from here and there yeah. if you're going to animate simply use a peer just use the simple drop downs don't make it complicated mm. by all means add in videos add in add in things that are going to create interest if they're relevant but don't put stuff in your slides just for the sake of waking the audience up it's your job as the presenter to keep the audience engaged and entertained in that way perfect so oh, Sorry, oh, Ian, I've, got an, I've got another quick tip on slides, if I may, mm. because often with PowerPoint, Absolutely. with PowerPoint, when you're presenting them, somebody will ask you a question. You'll think, oh, I've got that coming up in my slide deck. So you either ask people to hold on to that particular point and wait until you get there. And I've seen some people will whiz through the next few slides to then get to that particular point slide that they want so a tip for powerpoint is that you can jump around your slides and i do explain that point in the book and, and anybody that that can you can google it quickly as well and again other search engines would be available but if you know what slide number you are on <laughs> and know what slide number you want to have you can jump from the slide you're on 
to the slide number you want to present on. And the way in which I do that is, to my side, I've got a printout of six slides to a page that tell me what the slide numbers are. So you simply just print the slide six to a page. If I hold this up, whether it will focus enough. Yep, no, we can, we can see it, yep. Yep, so that will show you um, the, the slide six to a page and it tells you the slide numbers and you can jump from slide number whatever by tapping in the number on the keyboard and then hitting enter. That's all you do. So you need to know your slide number, you hit enter. And it simply jumps all the way through without you having to whiz through a whole load of slides and show your audience what, you've, what you're missing. That helps also to keep to time. And the other thing that I particularly like with PowerPoint is use of the letter B on the keyboard. Now this does of course mean that you need to have access to the keyboard when you're presenting. Uh, sometimes you don't have that and you might have somebody doing that remote control for you. But if you do, B for blank is also a really good one because not all remote controls that you have, all clickers that you have give you the opportunity to blank the screen and B will turn it black. Hit anything else on the keyboard and it brings it back. Actually, I've just brought a PowerPoint up in the background, Kate, and I'm just trying that as we're talking, and it works. <laughs> I, never, I, never knew, right, I never knew that. I just, I just thought I'd try yeah. it while we were talking, and it does work. Yeah. 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 I must remember you need that to, one. For, it to, for it to show it works, it needs to be as, as in slideshow. It needs yeah, to be I had it in slideshow, slideshow and yeah. I pushed B, right. and it worked, and yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. Right. So to quickly summarise our slide design, we want... Uh, fewer slides, fewer text uh, if possible, more images, um, in, rather than a white text with dark, uh, sorry, a white background with dark text, reverse that, a dark dark background with, with white text. Um, I'm guessing, uh, minimize minimal in, uh, animation, but am I guessing to avoid the Microsoft PowerPoint templates that we've all seen a million times? That's a big no-no, I assume. Um, it's up to you really from that perspective about PowerPoint templates because it can be, it depends how well you use them is all I would say. I, I personally tend to start with a blank slide and put my own things in. So it's, it's one of those points where you don't necessarily want to use all of the whizzy stuff that Microsoft give you. I also find I've seen one, I've seen one really good presentation done with Prezi, but I have only seen one really good presentation done with Prezi. I think it, you can make people seasick by using Prezi and adding too much in. Uh, so the fancy, the fancy you get, I think the, the chances are you're going to lose the message that you want to get across. It's all about the message and all about whether or not the method is supporting the message. Yeah. Every time I see Prezi, um, it makes me motion sick. Yeah. I, I find myself, I'm not, I'm, not really, I'm not really listening to what's being said, which is probably your point there. Um, last thing on design, having read your book, because I've got it here, um, must get you to sign this for me at some point, by the way. Uh, we, could you just speak to your, you, the comment you make in there about the power of three, just in case uh, anyone listening uh, is not familiar with that as a, as, a, as a law or a rule? Yeah, yeah. Well, right now we've, we've got a, a big power of three going on with the stay home, um, save the NHS, uh, stay, oh, now you see, I can't quite remember it, but stay home, protect the NHS and save lives. You know, that's a power of three. It's a key message that the government are trying to get across to us in the UK. That's the one they're using for the coronavirus situation. Um, it's about using the rhythmic power of three. So if you're looking at your presentation as a whole, we could use one that says chunk link flag. So you chunk your presentation down, you link your chunks and you flag verbally what chunk is coming up next. So what I'm about to say is dot, dot, dot. Um, and then you can also use the power of three in the terms of repetition. So one of the examples I like to use is, is there's a TV program that's called Location, Location, Location. It's not simply three. It, it's not four. It's not two. It's three. It's Location, Location, Location. So it's got that lovely rhythmic feel to it. You can use it to start sentences. And if you look at Mar Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream, he uses it more than three. But that element of repetition, I have a dream. 
I have a dream, I have a dream. And there's, there's ways in which good speech writers will use that to good effect. Yeah, so it's worth people doing a bit more research and reading around that. Kind yeah, of yeah, I suggest you, you... Questions just come in, mm -hmm. which, uh, is a really, which is a really good... Sorry, go on. No, go on, that's fine, yeah. I say, a question just come in, which uh, is really a good point from Yas, and he said, "Do do you think we should stick to two minutes for each point? I, I presume possibly means slide. I was always told one slide, one minute. I know different people have told different things, but essentially, what's the current? Is there a current rule for how we stick to a point or a slide for how much time? And and what's your uh, best way to to generally stick to timing? Any tips there?" Okay, so I would break every rule. If you've heard of uh, seven, seven points per slide, five, uh, five words per point, uh, two minutes per slide in speech, I would break all of that and say, no, it really doesn't matter what's going to help you get the message across. And if that means you are referring to a slide for 10 seconds just to illustrate something and quickly move on to something else that's fine so if you want to have a slide up there for 10 minutes to back up your talk and not move on from that that's fine but it's about does it support the message that's the key thing so in in that point of how much per slide there is a there is a, a school of presenting called Petra Kutcher which have a rule where you have to present and the slides automatically turn over after a certain number of seconds and you have a certain number of slides so if you're doing it within that Petra Kutcher framework of course you've got to stick to it but generally speaking presenting from a podiatrist perspective to get your message across you choose and you talked about in the last bit of the question there Ian was about how to stay to time keep an eye on the time some way shape or form have a clock nearby have somebody uh, tipped in the audience to give you a heads up um, or rather a hands up when there's 10 minutes to go depending upon the length of your presentation so you know when you can drop something and jump to the end that would be one of the key things about staying to time because if you need to leave something out providing you haven't told them there are three key points I wish to make and then you only get the chance to make two of them <laughs> <laughs> that would be one of the one of the one of the no's if you're going to say there are three key points I wish to make make sure you make all three points but if you've not said anything like that you can jump straight towards the end miss things out and don't tell people that you're missing it out just allow them to to say there's if you need to tell people that there's extra information they can have by going to whatever, whether it be a web page or you'll put something up online or send it out afterwards. But don't say, oh, I've had to miss a whole load of things out to stay to time, I think is incredibly frustrating and disrespecting to the audience. Yeah. And we're sort of coming into, when we're talking about sort of saying things to the audience, we're coming into, I feel like we've covered preparation quite well. Um, and we're now into kind of like, let's assume we, we know our audience, we've done our preparation, we've yeah. made a beautiful presentation. We're, me we're mentally, it's section two, the delivery of the talk, the bit that, that fills mo most of us with the most nerves, certainly me. Um, let's talk about that when we when we deliver some of the nuances of delivering the talk first off. And let's talk about nerves, they come in here. As, as has already been mentioned, I get very nervous. I I couldn't dream of preparing for a talk in two or three days. Uh, that would be like bad nightmare stuff for me. I need, I, I'm currently preparing for a talk that I'm scheduled to give on October the 4th. Uh, I, I was doing it today, just to let you know how I deal with my nerves, because I feel like my only, my only weapon against nerves is, is, is being prepared. Um, and I, help, I think that helps um, practice your timing as well. Um, so can we talk about your your tips and your 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 expertise on on dealing with nerves is it very personal do you have to find what works for you or is there any any sort of big wins with regards to getting on top of the nerves on the day yeah there there are certainly some there tips and, and it's interesting you say your your nerves tend to be the ones that you you find occur during the course of delivery for me my nerves and my anxiety would kick in beforehand so i find sometimes that i will have I used to have in particular I, I have far less now but crippling stomach ache prior to giving a talk and that would often be the, the day or two days beforehand and that's my anxiety um, 
what I find useful prior to giving the talk there is the preparation there is knowing that you have prepared or at least knowing that you know your stuff so for some people actually the preparation and doing the huge amount of preparation could increase their nerves rather than decrease it so just being aware that you know enough to get your point across that's one of the key things i think from a mental telling yourself that you are good enough to do this talk the audience will get this key message those are the key things that i think would be helpful from a mental preparation point of view physically when you're about to deliver a talk there's definitely something about posture and definitely something about breathing that make a massive difference to how you start a presentation so it's the deep breath it's the standing upright. It's also the pause that you make before you start to speak, rather than start to speak and then mumble. It's actually having the time to compose yourself before you speak. And yes, by all means, and I've noticed this, this, this thing's very, very handy. It's not gin, it's water. And, and have some water to hand, because taking a small sip definitely helps lubricate the throat and helps you sort of calm yourself down just a little bit. So for some people doing a sip of water, there might be routines um, that people have to do that work for you prior to giving a talk, whether it's, it's something that you, as you, you mentioned earlier, something that you wear, something that uh, you do physically there are some exercises that i've done prior to do giving talks prior to the world debating championship that you mentioned certainly is is doing some <laughs> form of breathing and calming exercises where i'm i'm centering myself and grounding myself both mentally and physically prior to giving the talk other people like to up their energy and it might be that some people like to pace around the room and do a run and, and get the energy going before they give their talk so it's going to be very individual about what works for you but definitely the impact that you have on the audience about whether or not you are feeling nervous would be if you stand prior to opening your mouth pause for a moment and then speak that gives the audience the impression that you are in control it might not be how you feel on the inside but definitely their perspective is very is is like right this person knows what they're doing you yeah, think thanks kate look there's <clears throat> there's several things that you said that actually um i do without actually being explicit that that's what i'm doing and you know I, I often do like to go for a walk outside before you know you enter in the auditorium just to clear your head um i often try to say to people who, who might be new to this you know it's all about you know being confident that you, you actually know your stuff but one yeah. quite specific problem it's not necessarily a podiatry problem it's more a say a, anyone in a science-based discipline there's things like honor students master's students phd students probably presenting their research for the first time and at a conference but they're presenting this research for the first time to the professors you know the best of the best and that's really quite daunting um phd students i presume are better than master students who are better than honor students because they're more more confident and i know i mean some of the not necessarily for my students but for for, for those that i know that are doing for the, this for the first time you know i often have a chat to them you know try to boost their confidence i'll often take them to meet the chairperson of the session and introduce them to the chairperson well before the, the session. You know, so hopefully that chairperson's got their back if something comes up. Um, you kind of hope that perhaps their supervisor might be sitting in the front row to, to perhaps handle something that might get very, very difficult. But I wonder if you've got any other advice for those, you know, first time presenters in front of, of people who probably know a lot more about the topic than they do. It's just that they're, that they're just presenting their particular research. Yes, and I, I think that's a, a valid one and also one very pertinent to me right now partway through my PhD because when you're presenting your ideas and your research, you do know your topic in that specific area, but you are also presenting to people who are there to critique it. Mm. And mm. what it sometimes feels as if happens is that they criticize it rather than critique it and that certainly for for someone who's got levels of a fragile 
uh, confidence, the imposter phenomenon or whatever it might happen to be, that criticising can feel very personal rather than critiquing. Um, so when you're presenting to someone, I, I guess the, the point would be, coming back to the what message do you want to get across, with an academic context in mind, I, I find it personally very difficult. So I can't say that this is a this is a comfort zone of mine. It absolutely isn't. It's out of my comfort zone in doing those forms of presentations. I felt criticised when I've done them before rather than critiqued. So I'm I'm sort of with your students that you said there, Craig, about in that level of discomfort. And I think the only suggestion I can have is do more of it. Because the more you feel that discomfort, the more comfortable you will feel with the discomfort. Mm. And therefore, the better you will become at doing it. Because mm. you, don't, you don't want them to be scarred that they never do it again. <laughs> no, no. Um, <laughs> so she's just thinking down to a meltdown that I had after being at one's levels of, of criticism that was levelled at me. And, and I was absolutely ready to throw in the towel. And it it was my supervisor that managed to pick me up and, and say, no, it's not you. There's certain things that were said that weren't appropriate, etc." So it is, it is very easy to take those comments personally. And I think the point is about putting it into context. That is what academia is. Academics critique, but some academics actually end up criticizing instead. Oh, I know. I've I've been at some scientific conferences, and which it's got quite brutal. Um, and it's, but then again, I, I, hopefully that's where the the chairperson of that session has perhaps got a bit. You know, the, the, these are new people presenting for the first time. The chairperson hopefully acknowledges that and 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 guides the process a wee bit better. Yeah, yeah. And um, a question has just come in for you uh, if that's okay Kate and it's from a is it Kate it's Kate it's from KT and she is a student who's just coming in with a question she recently gave a talk and she felt she subscribed to the sort of less is more uh, approach with her presentation um, and feels that uh, didn't get as, as good a marks as I'm paraphrasing what she said but didn't get as good a marks as she'd perhaps hoped feels in hindsight that the less is more approach was possibly detrimental um, any tips for students who who have to present in this way but at the same time need to make sure that a certain amount of content is covered yeah so from the academic perspective if i was doing a presentation and suggesting the presentation style i see really poor academic presentations because they've got so much on their slides and in in that context it could be that you might want to do two things if you want to subscribe to the less is more in what you're actually showing on the screen you create two slide decks so you have one slide deck that's the handout with the extra bits of information all of the references and all of the, the bullet points in that you want to say to people and you have a slide deck that you show that is pared down from the visual perspective and you verbally talk through the, the, the key points um, so that's the only way I would suggest you if you still want to stick with a pared down presentation you have the extra information in the handouts and it's, so it's like creating two presentations. Actually, it's interesting you say that, Kate, and I, I don't mean this rudely in any way, but you actually sound like one of my daughter's teachers. Um, <laughs> my, my, my daughters are 13 and they, they're often doing, have to do PowerPoint presentations for assignments and stuff like that. And I'm always on their back to about stop putting so much fancy stuff in, focus on the actual content, the message, you don't, the images, you don't, you know, and, and what you said is typically what their teacher says in the feedback and their assignments. Um, so even at this very young age, it's, it's, they, 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 it's, again, they're trying to make it look so pretty and ignoring yeah. the message. And that's the, the key thing that you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's coming back to, will it help you get the message across? And in academia, you've got to create a, a grounding of this is the research that I've done, these are the people that I've referenced, you've got to have some evidence behind you. It's not the same as putting a presentation across on, let's just, let's say presentation skills. It's actually needs more behind it. So that would be why I'd suggest you, you have an element of, you create two presentations, do one as, as handouts and, and do the other as the, the one that you want to show if you want to show that pared down one. Yeah. Um, 
two two questions which sound like they're a little bit off off piece but i know they're in your book and i know that they're, they're all part of this bigger picture first is dress codes uh, mm. is there a right way to dress or a wrong way to dress probably be contextual and off the back of that how do we conduct ourselves on stage how do we do we move if so how do we move because there's definitely i've definitely seen presenters that move too much i've also seen people that stand there really really weirdly and awkwardly because their hands are in robotic kind of positions so could you just speak to we, we talked about our slides and our confidence but how do we how do we look and how do we conduct ourselves on stage sure sure so dress codes really interesting because one of the things if you're doing things online now i would say don't wear green because the green screen effect can happen and and that's where people can can use that color green to and if you're on a green yes if you're on a green screen and wearing green though you meld into the background it doesn't quite work so watch for that watch for stripes patterns that are too much when you're online for presentations so for instance this is this is a shirt and a jumper now it's fine with the jumper over the top but the shirt itself might just be that little bit too busy if it was on its own so be aware of patterns and the effect that stripes can have also in particular if you're if you're doing presentations online so watch out for that um, dress code as in how formal or informal should you be there's going to be an element of what is your own comfort zone because if you are comfortable presenting in something that is more informal then that might be best for you to stick with i've seen a very effective presentation done by somebody who wore, wore jeans wore a, a denim shirt and gave the most brilliant presentation but then that was what his company's logo his company's style was and it suited him and the presentation whereas if i was to turn up in jeans and a, and a denim shirt hey, it would be too much denim um, but, but that aspect of presenting in that way would, would be quite difficult for me mentally so there's what works for you from a i'm prepared to present mentally as well and that might be wearing something that's smart it might be wearing a jacket it might equally be putting on something that's bright that's going to make you stand out or it might be just being you and being comfortable in whatever you happen to choose that morning so there's also certain places that i would dress up to present so for instance when I've been going into the city of London and doing presentations to city firms, I'm very much aware that their expectations of a presenter can be where you need to dress up more. So I would dress up and have what I would call, you know, much more of a tailored suit than a casual suit on. So there's no set hard and fast rules, Perfect. but I do think you should consider what you're wearing. That's the key thing. Um, from a conducting on stage point of view, don't stay rooted to the spot. So if, you're, if you present from behind the lectern, one of the difficulties of that is you tend to stay rooted, but you also have a tendency to grip the sides of the lectern. And, and that can show some levels of, of statics or can show your nerves. So if you feel comfortable enough to move away from the lectern, that shows again, it might not increase your feelings of confidence, but it increases the perception of confidence for other people watching. So moving out from the lectern can actually be a really good thing. Moving around on stage is going to vary. I've, I've seen, if you think about going back, Steve Ballmer, Microsoft, you know, the amount of energy and the amount of movement that he used to have on stage was enormous. My husband is a great pacer. There's no way can I get him to stand still. But if it's me, I will move. But when you make a key point, then stand still. And those are the key things is actually when you've got your key point to make, make sure you're grounded, make sure your feet, coming back to podiatrists here on the feet, the weight is equal on both feet. So you're not lopsided. You're, you're not sort of over and, and got your hip the hip sort of over one side and your knee bent and you, you're cockeyed you're actually st standing straight and grounded and mm. upright also makes a big difference so keeping your back upright rather than slouching and, and hunching over that helps with the breathing it helps with the projection but it also helps with increasing both the internal confidence and the appearance of confidence 
Mm. Right. Could I also get your take on something? And that is, we've got we're surrounded by the ability to watch so many people presenting now. We've got TED Talks, and and like you say, Apple and Google, and and there's so many amazing presenters out there. And and you watch people, and you see things you like. Um, I think so. You watch, say, Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk. I think still one of the most widely watched TED Talks. And he's just got the lot. He's he's clearly knowledgeable about his subject. He's witty at exactly the right moments. It's just, and you just think to yourself, I, I want to my next talk to go like that. <laughs> Where do you sit on the spectrum of trying to mimic others, copy, copying things that you've seen that you like, versus just being yourself and finding your own way or is there a is there a middle ground very much on the find what works for you uh, so don't try and copy i love sir ken robinson's talks and and i think as you said there the immediate thing that struck me is his use of humor is the way in which he can create the laughter but i don't think that comes spontaneously i think he is naturally humorous i don't know him personally but i would guess that he is naturally humorous but i would also think that he has crafted the humor into his talk at the appropriate moments so there's an element of craft when you're wanting to insert certain things and then you have to test it out comedians don't find their jokes land straight away. They do trial runs, they test it out and they rework a joke and rework it and rework it. And when you're giving a presentation, one of the downsides that you have is that you don't get that testing out opportunities. You don't get the open mic sessions to have a go at certain things, to rework them and rework them. Because often if you're practicing your presentation, you're practicing it to yourself. Um, you might be practicing it to the dog or your other half, but generally speaking, you don't practice it to an audience the same as a comedian would so the idea of of working out what works is best to look at what works for you rather than can I be somebody else but absolutely pick up some of the key tips and I think watching if you take Steve Jobs now everybody can think of Steve Jobs being a superb presenter but actually if you look at some of the early presentations he gave when he was with Apple that's one of the things to look at because he wasn't a good presenter in those very early days. He learned the skill. He grew into being able to present. And I think we need to give ourselves a bit of slack because actually, unless you present on a daily basis and have to do this on a really regular basis, then it might be that you are testing your skills and growing them over time, but just not rapidly. So recognize what you have learned and what you've done differently and what you've improved on from the last time you presented. But don't expect it to be perfect because A, nobody's is. But also we need to just think about, is it better than the one I did before? Yeah. yeah. Um, we had a question from one of our regulars, James, and now it feels like a good time to ask it. Um, what about midway through our talk, uh, dealing with things not going well? We've all been there um you know something's going wrong whether it's the vibe you're getting off the crowd you, you you just don't feel it's going well you forget what to say sort of on the fly we're in we're in the battlefield how do we deal with things not going our way that's a great question james and and it brings back a stomach churning moment to me as well as one of those like oh I, i've been there and experienced it and one of the mistakes that i've made was i didn't call it out so when I was doing a, it was a more of a group presentation and interaction, but I could feel that it wasn't quite going the way I'd expected. I wasn't quite getting the audience on my, on my side and I didn't say anything at the time. And I think sometimes if you recognize this has happened and you think it's appropriate, stop and just ask, but actually call it out and say, I'm getting a sense that you're not quite with me. What's happened here? Tell me a few things or discuss amongst yourselves where you want this to go next and then I'll get your feedback. So do a break of state and call it out and ask people if you think it's gone, if you think it's going off track. If though, as you mentioned there, Ian, you've forgotten what you're saying next, one of the things where to, to help me in that I keep the mind map to one side so I either have the six point the six to a slide sorry six slides to a page powerpoint to my side or I have a mind map 
and the mind map and being able to glance at that helps me pick up what's going next. Another way to break it would be to find a way of getting your audience to talk to each other. So throwing a question to them, getting them to have a discussion and just changing the state with the audience where you can then think of what's happening or you can go and speak to perhaps the person that's hosting it and finding out what's happening. I remember just as I'm speaking that one of the sessions I did to a group of Chinese business people and they'd given me a whole load of topics that they wanted me to cover and I did the first couple and then asked them to talk amongst each other to, to talk to themselves, went back to the, the, the host and, and she said, oh, we didn't want you to cover that particular topic that I had just covered, that they told me by email they wanted me to cover. I was like, oh no. So I had to have a discussion with her about, okay, so what specifically do you want me to do next? Where do you want me to take it and think on the fly? So sometimes it's getting the audience to talk to themselves and have a talk to each other and having that chance to check in with the host or, or check in with yourself to see where you, where it's going next. Great. Reassuring to everyone. I'm sure that even it, it sometimes doesn't go well for even you. So that's reassuring <laughs> to, to, to all of us. Um, another point I wanted to quickly bring up was, uh, again, I, I've read this in your book, um, is one of the things you mentioned there about never apologizing just don't mm -hmm. apologize for things if you if you have to, if you have to apologize for something then you should have fixed it beforehand so for example we've all seen the person say i'm sorry this slide's a bit busy well if you know it's busy you should have made it less busy before we we spoke um i remember giving a talk in in canada once and i was we, we landed the night before and i was horribly sick i was i was up all night in the bathroom i'd had like 30 minutes sleep man and I got to the stage and I remember going up and just giving the talk it went as terribly as you would imagine it would have gone uh, I went straight back to the hotel room where my wife was and she said how did it go I said it's terrible she said did you tell them how sick you'd been I said absolutely not I thought uh, you know the worst thing I could do is stand up there and, and give a caveat before the, the lecture by the way I've been really really sick um, could you just speak a little bit to the 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 sort of uh, the psychology behind not making caveats and not apologizing for anything. Well, yes. And I find it really interesting. It's one of the things that I learned very early on is never start with an apology. And I've seen it with people giving presentations where it's been received completely differently by different people. One lady I remember saying, uh, and she, she didn't apologize, but she started her talk by saying that she just finished the slides in the car park. Now, I took that when I was in the audience, I took that as, oh, you've tailored your talk specifically to us. But the person sitting next to me had said in her mind, it went, oh, she couldn't be bothered to prepare it in advance then. So when you do those sorts of offhand statements they can be received quite differently from the audience and then detract from your message so it comes back to what message do you want people to get across and that's the that's the thing it's do not or try not to do anything that detracts from getting your message across and an apology is one of those things that can detract from the message Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't had time to prepare fully. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't sound like a good start. Why are you standing up there then giving the presentation? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time. Well, why did you not then shorten the presentation that you're giving us? So it, it, it detracts from the impact of the message that you're giving. So I'd be with you and, and not, even if you've been really, really poorly, yet not give that apology up front. Um, it might be something that you want the introducer to say for you. So if you're being introduced on stage and giving a presentation, it might be something that they actually choose to say to the audience, but you personally don't. It's your presentation and it's you getting that message across. It's about perhaps using someone else to help facilitate that if you need to give some sort of apology. It's also that, like that those, those occasionally you see people admit how nervous they are at the start of their presentation and someone who Ian and I know very well, I can recall him, him doing that at a quite a major conference quite a few years ago. All I can remember now of his presentation was the admission of the nerves at the start. 
and then the audience feel nervous for the presenter you know, we actually, as the audience, want to have some confidence in the presenter. So if you tell them that you're feeling nervous, then they go, oh, my goodness, this poor soul. And, and that doesn't, it doesn't help. It's, it's similar to self-deprecating humor. It's don't put yourself too down too much. Now, there's elements of humor that can be good. And there's elements of self-deprecation that can be good, but not too much of it. Because I think that can also detract. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and the powerful close, let's call it. You know, everything about this has been about leaving a room with, like we say, with, 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 a, with a key message or, or multiple messages. Any tips for, you know, closing powerfully, as I think you, as one of the chapters in your book that labels it, um, what, what should a good summary, a good conclusion, what should that last slide and that last few, few moments of you speaking to the audience, should, what should that sound like? I'm smiling there because I've been picked up on closing more than once by giving a presentation and and that's not helpful. So you get to a close and you my brain goes, oh, I didn't say this. And so I then feel like I want to add that little bit extra in because it will be really useful for the audience. But then you're, again, coming back to the point, you're detracting from the message. If you'd have just stopped at the point where you were going to stop, it would have been better. So it's finding what your message is, being able to summarise it again at the very end, and then stopping. That's the powerful close. It's, it's learning when to do the zip, when to not say an extra explanation. So providing you know at the start what it is you want to say to people, what you want them to do as a result of your presentation, then when you get to the end of the presentation, you summarise it. You tell them what, you've, what, you've, what your key message is and what action you want them to take after your presentation. And then shut up. One of the things that I see people often do is a level of thanks at the end of the presentation as well and that also can detract from that key message so it's a little bit like how you start start powerfully start with that key grabber that key point about saying a statistic uh, a key point that i want to make this is something that you've got to know um, it might be a controversial statement so something along those lines that's going to get people's interest and then if you do that right at the end you can link back to it so you can make a top and tailored type close as well. Brilliant. So start and finish strong. Brilliant. So we finished our presentation. We're into the post talk. Two main things I want to talk about here. The first is the thing that we all dread because we can control the talk to a certain extent, but then the questions come. Um, and then that's where, you know, we can potentially have people in the audience that want to make a name for themselves dealing or handling uh, difficult or challenging questions um anything anything you want to speak about on this topic oh now i think there's there's i'm just thinking about situations that i've been in where i've not done it right uh, one is where, <laughs> where somebody challenged me and i quipped back to that particular individual it was not good i shouldn't have done it i shouldn't have put him down um I think sometimes if somebody is challenging you, be the bigger person, rise above it. Don't try and put them down. That's not good. Uh, one of the other things where I had a challenging member in, an, in a group of people, I should have asked that particular person to leave because they were being totally disruptive to the rest of the group. It was an evening presentation. It wasn't a, a business gig, but it was an evening presentation. And that individual was being so disruptive, I should have asked them to leave and I didn't. So those are two key points where I'm recognizing on reflection, it's actually sometimes better to tackle the issue, but tackle it in a way that you're going to be supportive to the person. So asking that individual to leave, I could have done it more than one occasion where I'd got people into small groups. I could have tapped him on the shoulder and said, excuse me, can I just have a quick word with you? Da, 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 being disruptive. You can either sit down and be quiet or it's time for you to go. And that would have been okay. 
um, somebody when they're asking you the disruptive questions from the floor is quite different and it might be that you're in the situation where you're able to say we'll take that one afterwards um, or it's a question of asking the chairperson to notice if somebody is asking too many questions to be able to direct the next question to somebody else um, so if you've got a good chairperson that can be really helpful if you are the one that's speaking and also chairing it might be again you having that strength to say thank you very much for the questions that you've asked so far could we give the chance for somebody else to ask a question you know or not even could we we're now going to give the chance for somebody else to ask a question make it a clear statement challenging questions that you want to avoid we see politicians coming out with with those with those answers that don't answer the question and everybody gets frustrated i think then honesty if there's a question that you can't answer be honest and say right now i haven't got an answer for that i don't know and so that that level of upfrontness yeah. i think is also really helpful brilliant yeah i, I sometimes say things yeah, that, that, and finally yeah. where do you stand oh. on so sorry i i, I sometimes say that that's okay, a good go I sometimes say things like that's actually that's a really good point i'm going to have to go away and think about that and i'll get back to you yeah those those from the debating style as well they, they give you thinking time craig so yeah. the the <laughs> adage of repeating the question as well can be very helpful it just gives the brain the chance to think of something so yeah that's a really good question let me take a moment to think about what you've said there repeat the press the question paraphrase it a bit and somehow the brain then kicks into giving an answer so yeah giving the, giving yourself a bit of breathing space and an opportunity to think about it can be very helpful um, last point uh, i wanted to ask kay is the post talk opportunity to receive feedback something that you do and you find helpful <laughs> helps you grow something like me if you're super sensitive it really hurts your feelings and you you you, you dwell on it for weeks uh, where, uh, you know what's the best approach because we are all in this to try and improve and we improve via feedback but some feedbacks really just quite mean and nasty so um, do we welcome it do we request it I think if you're going to request it what would be really useful is telling people what you want to know what you want feedback on that can be helpful so if you're wanting to give me feedback on the style the usefulness the what key point did you take away you can ask for that there's also feedback structure that can be quite helpful can you tell me what went well and if it were to be done again what would make it even better so you can ask for that structure so at least you get a positive and a developmental point and it's about what would make it even better rather than what did i do badly so that structure can be really helpful <laughs> but but getting getting feedback like you when somebody taps you on the shoulder says, well i've just got one thing that i'd like to tell you and you go oh no please don't um <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it can be painful because you've actually just given you're all you've just done your absolute best on a presentation and i think sometimes we need to recognize as members of the audience and people who are giving feedback that that's the key point say something positive if you've got a developmental point either don't bother saying it if it's not important or coming back to craig's point about the, from the academic side of things if you really need to give some feedback then it's about how you can do that that allows that person to still feel supported and confident at the end of it yeah yeah brilliant so, so i feel like we've done a really nice sorry, journey there in the, the are we going to request feedback on this presentation that was my point uh, for this never never we never ask no <laughs> never watch, never watch, never watch them back never ask questions i too i'm too fragile um I feel like we uh, we had a really nice journey through the, the you know the, the the life of a presentation from its genesis and it's the preparation of it, not just the, the slides themselves, but our preparation, what we wear, how we conduct ourselves, what the slide should look like, how we how we deliver it on the day, you know, etc. Um, certainly, everything I wanted to cover on my little sheet down here through my preparation has been ticked off. 
Craig, is there anything else that you want to no, no, we've bring covered, we've, up or cover as we approach the hour mark? No, I think we've, we've covered everything. There's no, no new questions have come in. So look, thank, thanks so much, Kate. It's gone really well. It's gone really quickly. Um, for those that have joined late, um, and there has been quite a few, I notice, Facebook will render this video. It'll be available for you to rewatch in about 10, 15 minutes. It'll be up on YouTube later today and the same with the um, podcast. I've put some links um, in the comments to Kate's books. Um, I'm certainly actually going to go and buy it. I, I, I did have a look for them on Audible. Yeah, but I'll yeah. wait for the... Um, so I certainly will go and buy them. There are a couple of links there to the book. So look, thanks so much, Kate. It's been really good. Um, I'm, even I've learned something. So it's sort of... Um, so thanks very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again, Ian, for, for the invitation to come on.